when I think of community, I think of all of the different individuals within a community. I think of the jobs those individuals have, how those individuals work together with each other, um, and ultimately to enrich their environment. Beyond this, I also think how those community members interact with their environment. Uh, we have uh, some communities that treat their environment well or don't harm their environment, and others that aren't as cognizant of the impacts that we have on these environments. Um, but what I'm here to talk to you guys about today is not necessarily human communities. I'm here to talk about bacterial communities, uh, specifically those that live on and within our human bodies, known as the human microbiome or the human microbiota. Now you may ask, why, why talk about um, human community traits? What does this have to do with bacteria? Um, and the thing is, is that a lot of these principles also apply to these interactions that are occurring with microbes. These interactions that we're aware of as we live in communities with other human beings, uh, we know that these similar things apply and help us to understand what's occurring with these microbes. And just like us, these microbes interact with their environment. I mentioned that we can have a beneficial impact on our environment, or we can have a negative impact on our environment. These microbes have similar phenomenons that occur, um, but the environment is us. To put these numbers into perspective a little bit, uh, within the human body, there's approximately 37 trillion cells. It's quite a large number. Bacterial cells, uh, recent estimates range from about 40 million all the way up to 100, or 40 trillion, excuse me, all the way up to 100 trillion. So what this means is there's at least one bacterial cell for every human cell in your body, and probably a lot more. Um, and most of us, when we hear bacteria, here we hear of the concept of bacteria, we think of pathogenic organisms. We think of things like Staphylococcus aureus, uh, or the antibiotic resistant strain you may know of as MRSA. Or we think of Escherichia coli, or E. coli, and some of the nasty bugs that can cause. But really, these are just a small, small percentage of the total amount of microbes that really live on our bodies, as well as living all across the Earth. <laughs> Now, you may ask yourself, okay, if there's all of these microbes for every one of our cells, how come we're not just big blobs of microbes? How come we look like human beings rather than just these big microbial colonies? And that is because there's a pretty starch, uh, stark uh, difference in the size of these two or of organisms. So this is just an extremely crude drawing of a, of a chromosome. Uh, for instance, this is chromosome one. Within your cell, you have 46 chromosomes. Uh, all packaged within your nucleus, this one little area of your cell. So just one tiny bit of a human cell. This is about 7 to 10 micrometers in size. So very, 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 very small. By comparison, our bacterial friends, these, the average size of an E. coli cell is about 2 micrometers. So what, what makes up just a very small part of our cell is already larger than these microbes. So, so that's why, given the large numbers of them, there is about two to six pounds of bacteria on and within our bodies, coexisting with us. Beyond these bacterial organisms, there's also other organisms like archaea, uh, there's other eukaryotic organisms, and a whole bunch of viruses that live within and on our body. So it's good to know, right? <laughs> um, so, as I mentioned, we have all these communities in all these different areas, and you have different communities residing in different parts of the body. You have one microbial community that may reside behind the ear, or one that may reside within your mouth, or one that resides in your lower gastrointestinal tract. All these organisms and all of these communities have different traits, and a lot of this is based upon the, the area that they find themselves in. So, as you can, you, if you can imagine, these microbes find themselves in, a, in an environment that's warm, uh, arid, not a lot of nutrients available, that's going to dictate what community of microbes can live there. In the same way, if there's a lot of nutrients, if there's a lot of uh, moisture, a lot of things of that nature, that's going to dictate what community lives there. And that's going to dictate what those communities do. Just like with human communities, you can imagine uh, people living within an area that has a specific resource, say mining or uh, farming, those, those communities are going are gonna to adapt around those, those resources that are available. And this is the same way to think about these microbes. And you may ask yourself, okay, great, wonderful, we have microbes on us, how does this impact us? Um, and really this is a symbiotic relationship. This is a relationship that 
is great for both us and the microbes. Uh, first off, we give them just a home to live, a nice warm home with access to, to nutrients. As we eat food, this food passes through our gastrointestinal tract, and these microbes gobble it all up in the same way we do. They also produce pretty essential vitamins for us. There's things that our cells just do not develop anymore, and these microbes uh, living with us, coexisting with us, are able to take some of the foodstuffs that we eat, process it in a manner, and then pass those vitamins on to us. But they also play a pretty, pretty interesting role in how they impact our health. There's signaling as well. With it, as we develop, uh, different Im our immune regulatory mechanisms, are, uh, these microbes send signals as we develop, as well as proper uh, stress response. We find that if you grow up a mouse with no microbiome, they have a, a, a distorted response to stress when they get older. So expanding a little bit on the role in human health, because these, there really is far-reaching, the most obvious role is the immune system. So the immune system is this system that's supposed to fight off microbes, supposed to fight off viruses and invaders and the like. But these microbes really play a very integral role here. Uh, just, just the presence of these microbes, just those microbes being present on your body, uh, on your skin, in your gastrointestinal tract, prevents other microbes from coming in. The communities that exist are utilizing these nutrients and, and doesn't allow for anybody, any new guys to come in and to, to, to utilize some of those nutrients. I also mentioned how the microbes uh, help us develop our immune response. But once our immune response is developed, we get different signals from our, from our ecosystems or from our environments that say to upregulate an immune response, say if something's trying to invade you or something, um, or downregulate that immune response. If there, maybe there's an allergic reaction, uh, you may want to downregulate that immune response. Um, all of these signals are also impacted by these microbes. Um, and we don't know a ton about how these work, but we know that there seems to be some sort of interaction occurring. And there's a number of factors that can, that can change these, the composition of these communities. For the most part, we believe that they're relatively stable, that once you're about three years of age and up, that your microbiome is developed. And you know, unless some big changes happen, uh, it's pretty stable. But there's some things that have been known to, to change it on a small scale and some on a large scale. Things like diet, what you eat, um, if you prefer protein, carbohydrates, fats, stuff like that. Uh, exercise, lack thereof, uh, antibiotic use, gastrointestinal tract disease. All these things can upset these communities living on our bodies. Um, and this upset is known as dysbiosis, general disagreement of our microbes versus our immune system. This can cause you know, things like uh, allergic responses, um, all the way up to more serious things like colorectal cancer. So it's only been until re recent that we've been able to study these microbes, because there's so many of them, but they're really hard to grow in a lab. You have to create the perfect conditions. They may need two, three, four other microbes present just for them to be able to grow. They may even need specific uh, signals from us to, to allow them to grow. So it's been pretty difficult, but with the, the invention of two uh, technologies, namely DNA sequencing being the first one, and the computational resources necessary to analyze that data have allowed us really to take a better look at this uh, and look at these community structures by sequencing all of the DNA present within these bacterial communities. And so that's what we're doing currently at Avera, is we're use, use, using uh, human individuals and we're taking the DNA from these bacteria, we're sequencing those bacteria, and we're starting to analyze and ask hypotheses about these bacteria and about how they're implicated in things of human health like obesity. So how we do this is we use monozygotic twins, genetically identical twins, and we do this because we know that these are genetically identical. So we know if they, if they differ in something, if one twin is heavier than the other twin, we know that is most likely due to something that is non-genetic. So we can start to ask some really cool questions with this type of design. So, as I mentioned, we have these twin pairs here. And we're starting to move forward with using larger sets of these twin pairs. So we, we, right now we've done 80 and we're working on some, some really cool studies where we're, we're really starting to identify certain microbes that are influenced in a lean, in lean individual or a heavy individual and that are implicated in the development of body fat or possible development of body fat. Um, so with, we're sequencing more twins. We're currently working on this and we're also sequencing their spouses. And we're doing this because you can start to ask very interesting questions 
We know what microbes may be shared between the two twins, and that they probably might be associated with the genetics of their host. But if there's certain microbes that are shared between the twin and their husband, that they're genetically unrelated, well, those, those microbes may have came just from living with that person. So we know that there's different parts of these microbes that are controlled by our genetics, different parts that are controlled by environment, by the people that we live around. There's been some research showing that we live with this cloud of microbes that, that essentially follows us everywhere we go, and everyone we impact or we interact with, we're possibly exchanging microbes with. It's nice to know, uh, look around at who you're sitting, sitting by. But yeah, there's a lot of really cool things, and really far-reaching far things, and a lot we really don't know, because this is very, a really relatively early, early field. And so it's, as I said, it's really early, but it's starting to show its head in the clinic, and I, I would take a guess to say that we will see this in future medicine quite a, quite a bit. Um, one of the very limited areas that it's been already impl implemented in uh, the clinical realm is with the uh, treatment of Clostridium difficile infection. So Clostridium difficile infection is an infection that arises after you get a, a course of antibiotics. These antibiotics, they wreak havoc on the microbes that, that live on our body. And when you wreak havoc on this, these communities, structures, they get broken down and they allow for pathogens, opportunistic pathogens like C. diff to move into the neighborhood and, and cause trouble. And this really does cause a lot of pretty nasty disease and it's really, it was actually kind of hard to get rid of because you would just try and prescribe more antibiotics to get rid of that microbe. Well, it kind of exacerbates the system because you never allow for a proper community to rebuild. Um, but what they found is if you can transfer the healthy microbes from a donor to that individual, it clears it up pretty quick. And almost in a matter of days, you get pretty substantial relief from these symptoms, and it's hypothesized that it's because you're reestablishing this, this gut microflora in that individual. Now, this is just one, one use, um, but there's, this is a possibility to be used for a, a multitude of, of different microbial-induced uh, phenotypes or traits, such as maybe obesity in the future, or other things, even far related to mood disorders. Anxiety and depression uh, has been actually associated with these microbes. Uh, we know that with obesity, a lot of times it becomes, uh, comes other comorbidities, things that come along, there's depression, all of those things, they, they came to be associated with, with the general obese state. And we know that these microbes can also induce these similar, these similar traits along with the phenotype, and, and, and so they may be there may be ways to harness this in the future. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the introduction of the microbe itself. Uh, we could introduce a prebiotic or some sort of molecule that will help enrich for a microbe of interest. Um, this is one of the routes nature takes. Uh, when a baby drinks breast milk, there's specific molecules within there that will enrich for certain microbes to grow within the gastrointestinal tract of that baby. That, that aids in the baby's proper development of different things like the immune system that I mentioned earlier. So all these different ways are, are possible ways that we can utilize the things that we're, work, we're, we're learning in the basic research and translate that into the clinic. Um, you know, like I said, as I keep going back and I keep prefacing, as a whole, it's still quite young that we've really developed, because we've really had to rely on DNA sequence te technology, uh, computing technology, and all of these things to come together to create an environment that we can even study these things. There's still going to be a, a large need for animal-based studies, for doing a whole bunch of genetically identical mice, looking at their microbiome, as well as looking at human studies, more like what we do at Avera. Uh, both of these have, have very uh, strong implications for, for really deducing what molecular interactions are, are necessary and, or what microbes are, are necessary for uh, a healthy phenotype. And as I mentioned earlier, it's also really hard to nail down how to get these exact conditions to get a specific microbe to grow and to exist in the ecosystem. But this work is still going to be extremely necessary in the future because once we've identified which microbes matter, which microbes will make us happy, or which microbes will help us lose weight, um, we need to know how to get them into the system and help them live, help them thrive, help them get the things they need to grow. But overall, uh, my personal sentiment, and I feel the sentiment as, as re of researchers as a whole, is these mechanisms have some very great possibilities to be exploited um, for human health and for our livelihoods in general. Thank you.